Welcome. Today we are going to talk about some basic complex analysis, specifically harmonic functions. Now, as I've said, I want this to be generally accessible to anyone who knows some calculus. So because of that, well, I'm not going to go through every detail of complex analysis. That's not the point. I do want to at least give a little background here and there. And so we'll start off with the notion of the power series. And back in the sort of classical calculus days, a power series and a function were seen as more or less the same thing. So you've probably seen a formula like this, the standard Taylor series formula. And so that is a way of combining the various derivatives in order to get a series that would be centered at some point z naught, and in complex we want it to converge on some open neighborhood, which will be a circle. In real analysis, it would be an interval of the real numbers, but we're in two dimensions here. Now, the reason why this is why complex is so nice, because when you're dealing with real numbers, you could have lots of derivatives and no way of knowing whether this series converges. There are plenty of examples in real analysis where all the derivatives exist, and yet when you add them up, they do not add up to f. That doesn't happen in complex analysis. And so the early people doing it, Cauchy and Riemann, I assume were some of the main ones, found a condition. One, way, one condition would be that del over del z of f exists at z naught and del over del z bar of f is always zero on d. Anytime you've got some number in d. So that's saying you can do the derivative with respect to z, and you can also rewrite it in terms of z bar, the conjugate, and that will be zero. But an easier condition, maybe, is what are called the cauchy riemann equations. And to do these, you do the idea of writing it as a coordinate function. So instead of writing f of z, f is a function of a single complex number, you write it as f of x plus i y. And so that becomes, or you can write it as f of x comma y if you prefer, it's the same thing. And this becomes u of x y plus i b of x y where u and v are both taking the complex number x comma y and mapping it to a real number. So that is to say, this is the real part and this is the imaginary part. Now there is a rule here, a test that I guess Cauchy and Riemann came up with I don't know the exact history, but I assume they both played a role. Which is to say, if I do del u over del x, and I'll do del u over del y, del v over del x, and del v over del y, that these two are equal. And these two are opposites. So if you were starting complex analysis, that would be a law you need to memorize, these formula, these, this relationship between the different partial derivatives. 
del u del x and del v del y are the same thing. Del u del y and del v del x are, I, I think I have that backwards, sorry. The, I apologize, that was, that's embarrassing. This one is supposed to be equal, and this one is supposed to be opposite. Okay, that's my first embarrassing mistake out of the way. Hopefully that's the only one today. Okay. So now that we have that, that gives us a definition or a criterion for testing whether a function is holomorphic. And the thing about holomorphic, we said holomorphic is th this... Um, yeah, let's just state it here. If this is true, then f is holomorphic. And holomorphic is essentially the complex version of being differentiable. It's more or less the same idea as having a derivative. But what's nice about it is that then there is a local power series. So again, this is something that is very different than in real analysis. Because in real analysis, knowing a derivative exists does not tell you whether it has a power series or not. But here, let's take some open ball, or some, not ball, but some open set like this. Oddly shaped set. And if we pick a point in this set, we'll call this big set D, that is open and connected domain. So domain is a little piece of vocabulary there. It just means the set is both open and connected. So we pick a point here, Z naught in D, and if the cauchy riemann equations are true there, then there is some ball where if we do the power series at z naught, it will converge on that ball. And if that's true for every point in D, then we say the function is holomorphic on D. Now, the reason we want to talk about this is because it means the individual components have a special property too. So... Let's take that, what we just said. We had ux, if I use this notation for partial derivatives, ux equals vy, and uy equals negative vx. Now let's put a del del x on the first one. And let's put a del over del y to the second one. This will give us uxx equals vyx. And it will give us, for the second one, uyy equals negative vxy. Now if I add these together, if these two things are equal which happens when we have a certain level of continuity, then we could add straight down and get uxx plus uyy equals zero. Now, the way I see it, holomorphic functions are already known to be important. So we say, well, there's this additional condition here of each of the components. Because if we did this with v, we could do the other partial derivatives, and we could get vxx plus vyy equals zero. This triangle is sometimes used as a symbol, which is del squared del x squared plus del squared del y squared. It's called the Laplacian operator. And so what we're saying then is that if we apply the Laplacian to u or into v, we get zero. So this seems important. We need a name for the components of a holomorphic function. 
and so we end up calling them harmonic functions. And so as a standard idea here of math, really, we have something we want to explore. We need to give it a definition that can be defined no matter what. So that Laplacian is going to be our definition. Okay, so a real valued function u on an open, uh, I was about to say disk, not disk, on open set d contained in c is harmonic provided All second derivatives exist and are continuous and del u is always zero on d. So u is mapping d, which is a subset of c, into the real numbers. So that's sort of, there's this maybe duality kind of thing between holomorphic and harmonic. A holomorphic function is on complex numbers. Harmonic function, it go, it's also defined on complex numbers, but its range is part of the real numbers as opposed to holomorphic function. But a holomorphic function has harmonic components. So those harmonic functions are really what we want to focus on. Most of what we've been doing so far relies on some harmonic functions. A converse to this partial converse is suppose u is harmonic at z naught then there exists a v such that u of z plus i v of z is holomorphic locally. That is to say, we have a set d again. And if we know it's, holom it's harmonic, u is harmonic at this point, then we can draw a circle around it where when we combine it with some other harmonic function, V, actually V is also harmonic, and together they make a holomorphic function on that open disk. But that function may not extend globally. It may get to the edge here. You got a full circle that's touching the edge, and then if you try to extend any farther, you lose the symmetry and it no longer converges properly. So that much we can guarantee that if we've got a harmonic function, we can find what's called a harmonic conjugate, a partner to go with it, so that together they make a holomorphic function, provided you don't stray too far away from the center. Now, the main reason why I do this is because of one very important example, that is the logarithm function. Log z, or log of r e to the i theta, you can always write a complex number as r e to the i theta, is defined as natural log of r plus i theta. And this is basically because it works. If we do e to the log z, that's e to the ln of r plus i theta, 
which is e to the ln r e to the i theta, which gets us right back to r e to the i theta. And the other way works too. If you do log of r e to the i theta, you well, I don't want to do log of e to the r e to the i theta, so that's not let's not do that. But it works the other way too. You can work it out for yourself if you like. But there are a few problems when introducing the log function, namely, which theta do we use? If you've got a point here, the angle could be 30 degrees or 390 degrees or, you know, there are lots of co-terminal angles, lots of different options to use. So you have to define what theta is allowed to be. And typically the principal logarithm, as we call it, which is why I'm using the capital G, is that theta is an negative pi to pi. Now, so I said we have to, to define it well, we have to restrict the theta, but you'll notice I'm using an open interval. Why can it not equal pi? Well, the basic reason is we have to define some ray where it doesn't exist. And usually it's the negative infinity, or negative real axis, doesn't have to be. But the idea is mainly about continuity. If we were traveling a path like this, when we cross this point, the log would have to switch instantly from somewhere near pi, or the, the i pi to i negative pi. There would be a jump discontinuity there where it would suddenly switch sides. And we don't want that. We want this thing to be continuous where it's defined. So we have to rule out some piece of it. Once we have that, we then can focus on something more familiar to us, the log of absolute value of z. So hopefully you recognize this is quite similar to the potential function that we spent so much time with before. Now, what is the absolute value of z? Well, if this is z here, or let's even call it z naught, it is the ln, or that, sorry, let's try this again. Absolute value of z naught is the distance from the origin, which is the same thing as r, so it's log of just r, or ln r, since it's a real number, which means it is the real part of the log function. So therefore, log z is locally harmonic for z not equal to 0. Locally harmonic might be redundant. Harmonic is a local property. We pick any point, it'll be harmonic there, except for zero. Now you might say, well, what if you picked a point on this green bar that we said is undefined? Well, that's not hard to fix. We just draw a new green bar. So we say, here's my z naught this time. I'll just rule out the positive axis instead, or really any other ray you want. And so then instead of that, I'll just say it's between 0 and 2 pi, where 0 is the one that's not allowed. And so now we can do that. We can define it on that interval. Neighborhood, sorry. So it will still locally be harmonic. It will still meet the property there and be harmonic in some neighborhood. So that's a conclusion that we really need to just except. So from, I'm not going to prove this again. It's going to say log of z is harmonic when z does not equal zero. And the same way true for negative log of z, which is the same as log of 1 over norm z. That will also be harmonic. And that is the function that we've used as the basis for most of what we did in potential theory. All right, so 
We're now going to go on to some other examples here. If u is harmonic on d, then g of z is u sub x minus i u sub y, both evaluated z, is holomorphic on d. So if we have a harmonic function. We said one thing, there is a conjugate of it, v, that will be together make a harmonic function, harmo holomorphic function, excuse me. But we can also make one just by using the partial derivatives here. And this comes straight out of the cauchy riemann equations. We know that, make sure I got this right, ux equals negative u y. No, sorry. Let me make sure I've got this right. Let's do the test here. So the test here is we take the x derivative of the real part. Let's maybe write this this way. Del del x of the real part should equal del del y of the imaginary part. So that is to say u x x should equal, if we do that here, this will give us negative u y y. Is that statement true? Well, it is equivalent to the statement u x x plus u y y equals zero. But that's what being harmonic means. At least that's half of what har being harmonic means. And the other half, we say del del y of the imaginary part needs to equal del negative del del x of the real part. So that is a, I keep mixing them up, that should be an x, that should be a y. So let's say the imaginary part del del x of that will be negative u y x, and the real part will be negative u x y. That is true as long as the second derivatives exist and are continuous, which is also the other part of the definition of being harmonic. So that's an example then. This thing we created is holomorphic. Not super deep, but worth looking at. Now I want to get into some really more important properties here. So first I'm going to talk about the mean value property. Now I'm not going to prove this. Um, the way you construct it is you start off by defining integrals in the complex numbers on holomorphic functions and then you somehow carry that over to harmonic functions since they're so closely related. But I'm just going to state what it is. A function u mapping d into r, and if I say d, assume it means an open connected set in the complex numbers, is harmonic on d. If and only if u is continuous on d and given any disk d a r which is contained in d so a disk centered at a with radius r u of a equals 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi u of a plus r e to the i theta d theta. So take a minute 
to think about what that means, but I think the picture is almost more useful than the words. So again, we have an open set D of some sort. This is saying that assuming U is harmonic on D, we can pick a point. And then once we've picked that point, if we draw a disk small enough to be contained in D, then the value at the center is the same as the mean value of the integral along the outside, or of the mean value of the outside. We can integrate all along the boundary, because that's what a plus re to the i theta is. re to the i theta gives you a circle of radius r plus a, center of the day. So we integrate along the outside of that circle, we get a value. We divide that by 1 or 2 pi, and that is the same as the value at the center. And it works the other way, too. If we can show that any disk, or really just a sufficiently small disk, it doesn't have to be for every, it can be shown with just fewer, just saying there's some disk small enough that a smaller disk will work. If we can show it meets this property, this mean value property, then it's harmonic. It works both ways, if and only if. So let's show a few examples of what this is useful for. I'm going to clear this part. Here we go. So first off, I want to do this little thing here. Z minus Z naught. Let's go to R of U of Z dx dy. Now Z minus Z naught less than R, that's a disk. So we've got some disk here. Z naught in the center, radius R. And we're going across the entire disk this time, not just the boundary. Because it says less than or equal to, not just equal. Now, we can change this into polar coordinates. We can say this is the same as going from theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi. That's a full circumference. And then we can integrate from rho equals 0 to rho equals r. So rho is any smaller radius that's inside of it. Of u of z naught plus rho e to the i theta. Rho d rho d theta. So that's classic change of variables formula there. We then rearrange this. We'll switch. Can we switch the orders? And yeah, we can. We can do this. And this gets into what's called Fubini's theorem, which says, are we allowed to switch it? And I'll show a more detailed example of this on the next one. But for now, let's just go with switching the order here of... Uh, rho integral of 0 to 2 pi u of z naught plus rho e to the i theta d theta d rho. Now that, since u is harmonic, we can just use the mean value property to evaluate that. That, this outer integral, we'll leave alone of rho u of z naught times 2 pi. So that's just using the formula. It said the integral, we divide by 2 pi to get u of z naught, so we'll multiply by 2 pi instead to balance it out. And so we have this. Now, 2 pi, z, 2 pi u of z naught, that's all constant. So 2 pi u of z naught, integral from rho equals 0 to rho equals r of rho d rho. And then once we have that, well, that's a calc 1 integral, so I'll trust you can work that one out on your own. 2 pi u of z naught rho squared over 2, which becomes pi r squared u of z naught. So u of z naught is 
1 over pi r squared double integral over the z minus c naught less than or equal to r u of z dx dy. Let me see if I can just clean that up a little. It's a little. Is that a, that's an r there. A little messy there. This is the uh, the limits, so it's not part of the function. It's just telling you where to integrate over. Mm. Oh, that should be a z naught there also. So this is kind of similar to the previous. Or, no, no, it should not be a z naught. Excuse me, bad. It's kind of similar to the previous one. In the previous one, we said we integrate along the outside and divide by the two pi. Here, we divide along the area, integrate along the area, and then divide by the area. Okay, so that's another formula that might come in useful, another sort of mean value formula. But here is the biggest thing I want to prove, and this is this. Let's go back to our potential function, u to the mu of z. We define as the integral across all of mu of the log 1 over absolute value of z minus t d mu of t. So that is to say we've got some blob here, which is the support of mu, which is sometimes connected to the E we talked about in previous ones, but maybe not. This is all the places where it's non-zero. And we're saying if we pick some point Z, and then we integrate all the different places across all of T. This is a function of Z. The integral is part of the process, but it is not an integral of itself. So, since it's a function of Z, the question is, if the inner function, the integrant here, log of 1 over ZT is harmonic, is this harmonic? Is the potential harmonic as well? Well, the answer is yes, and we're going to show why. Or yes, outside support of mu. I'll try to write an E, but that should be a mu. So if we picked a point inside this, harmonicity might break down. But as long as we're staying outside of it, we will get a harmonic function. Now this appears in Saf's paper, this property. I'm not entirely sure what proof he would use. He said, prove it yourself. So I'm going to give you what I see, which is using the mean value property. Now, he said prove it before he introduced the mean value property, which makes you suspect there's another way. But I'm going to do it this way, because I think it would be a good practice either way. So, let's draw a set here. I'm going to call this E. We'll say E is the support of mu. I don't think there's a problem with that. And E is compact. That is to say it's closed and it's bounded. Okay, so let's pick a point in E complement. And the complement of a closed set is open, so E complement is open. So therefore, I can pick a point out here, call it A, and we can draw a circle around it. Oh, by the way, the um, u to the mu z is easily shown to be continuous outside support E of support of mu. You know, it's a... Um, 
the integrand is continuous, the log of 1 over zt, absolute by zt, so the integral with it will also be continuous. That's fundamental theorem of calculus, I think, is all you need for that. So anyway, what we really want to focus on is this um, other property, the mean value property. If we can show that holds, then we'll be good, and it will be shown to be harmonic. All right, so here's A. There exists some R, such that D of A, R, is contained in E complement. So let's evaluate the thing we started with, the thing we were trying to figure out. What is 1 over 2 pi integral from 0 to 2 pi u to the mu a plus r e to the i theta d theta. That is, we're going to integrate the potential function on the outside of that blue disk that I drew. Well, we'll just substitute n. That's the same as 1 over 2 pi of 0 to 2 pi of integral parenthesis integral of log of 1 over a plus r e to the i theta minus t d mu t, close parentheses, d theta. Now, we've got a double integral here, a double integral of this log function. Can we exchange it? Well, Fubini theorem would say if we do the double integral of the absolute value of this whole thing, d mu t d theta. And if that is less than infinity, so if we take the absolute value inside the log, or inside the integral, as this log function can be negative for small values inside. And we don't really know how large or small the this argument here is. It could be very small or very large. But if we can show that the integral exists and is finite with the absolute value there, Fubini's theorem says that means we can go back to the original one and exchange them as we wish. Well, let's think about what we know. Here, this is compact. Continuous, and it's compact. That tells me there's a maximum and a minimum. In fact, we can probably figure it out at least intuitively, this point we would say is the closest. So when you take the the distance here, since what we are really me measuring here is the distance between a point on the circle and points in E. And then there's a reciprocal, so that'll be actually the largest value for the log. And some farther away point will be the largest distance, which makes the smallest value of the log of the reciprocal. So point being, there is a maximum value here, either the most negative or the most positive. It's hard to say which. Well, maybe it's not hard, but we don't really need to worry too much about it. All we need to know is that it exists. This has an upper bound. We'll call it M. There is some point in there where, since we've got a fixed point Z on the circle, there's some point where it gives us the largest possible value. So this double integral is less than or equal to double integral of M d mu t d theta. I guess there was that 1 over 2 pi we should probably bring down. Uh, 
Um, with the 1 over 2 pi, these are both unit measures, so this just equals m, which is less than infinity. So that's sufficient. We don't even need to know what it is. We just need to know that, that it exists. Since there's an upper bound, it does exist. It's so upper bound for the integrand, and the measures themselves are finite. So between those two facts, that tells us that this integral does exist. So with that said, we go back away from the absolute value. We go back to this guy that we started with. And now we can interchange the integrals. We get integral of 1 over 2 pi integral from 0 to 2 pi of log of 1 over a minus t plus re to the i theta. I'm just rearranging the order of the terms. d theta d mu t. But now this is a path whose center is a plus t, a minus t. That is, this is a minus t is a point here, and we have a radius r. So the harmonic function mean value property says we could just change it to evaluate the function, that is the log of 1 over z, at the center, which turns this into the integral of log of 1 over a minus t d mu t. And that is the definition of u to the mu of a. So let's look at the chain we've got here. We started with this, and we ended with this. That's the mean value property. Therefore, the potential is itself harmonic. So we can say that. u mu of z is harmonic outside of E complement. No, sorry, in, outside of E, I meant to say, or inside E complement. So that is going to be very important. This idea of being harmonic inside a certain open set is part of being a Green's function. And our next video will be all about what a Green's function is and how they are relevant to our subject. But that was the main result I want to show, was the harmonic. I want to introduce one other thing before we leave, before we wrap this up. Excuse me. And that is the max-min principle. Right. So this is another thing that is started with proofs in holomorphic function and gets carried over to harmonic. A harmonic function on a domain D cannot attain an internal max or min, unless it's constant. So what do we mean by this? Well, I like I said, I don't want to try to prove it. I'm just going to give sort of a proof by picture here. So here's a, dis, a domain D. Then let's pick a point here in here somewhere. There's a z naught, the radius r. Okay. Now we say, assume, let's just do as a contradiction, assume z naught is a max. Well, then that means that f of z naught is greater than everything on the boundary.
But then you take the integrals of both sides, f of z naught, integrate it with respect to the theta, would be greater than 1 over 2 pi integral from 0 to 2 pi, f of z naught plus re to the i theta, d theta. So we integrate from along the boundary, and we divide by 2 pi on both sides. The left side will just, it's a constant, so it'll just come out to itself. And that means it's greater than that integral, which is contradicting the mean value principle that we spent so much time talking about. So that's wrong. Unless it turned out it was, e well, no, we already said it can't be equal. Um, uh, if it were equal everywhere, eh. Yeah, I guess this should be a greater than or equal to, because max includes a possibility that's equal everywhere. But if it's equal, then the thing is constant, which we said is a possibility. If it's not constant, then something on the left is got to be greater than the right, and that means it would violate the mean value principle. And same is true for minimum. It can't have an internal minimum either. So that means most common use for this, well, for starters, we can know values on the boundary of a set, a compact set, based on, if we know those values, we can define the harmonic function, is what I meant to say. Another thing to say is that that means if u is harmonic on some open set D. I know we specifically talk about a disk here, where well, now we're saying more general open set. And that just is topology about building open sets from disks. I don't want to go through all that right now. But the idea here is then, if U is harmonic on open set D and continuous at the boundary then it has max slash min on the boundary. So if instead of that open D, we had a closed D like this, we know U is harmonic on all of it, it can't have a max in the inside can't have a local max or man on the inside, but it must have a max or man somewhere because it's compact, so it must be here at the boundary. And so we just say, we take it being harmonic on the inside, the open set, and then we just take the limits at the boundary to continue it to there where it will have a max and min. So that gives us yeah, that's basically what we need to know about harmonic functions. And next time we will use this to explore the more complicated Green's function. And I will see you then.